Wow, to be it is my first time here and I couldn't imagine a better place to, to speak. Um, I also think I'm really pleased that I'm speaking during those days when the stock market is hitting all-time highs rather than at the bottom of a bear market. I probably have 40 people here in the audience um, not really wanting to listen about stocks at all. Um, my best known book, I've written Future for Investors, uh, is my second book. The first book, which just a year and a half ago came out with sixth edition, and I'm gonna show you some slides from that book, Stocks for the Long Run. As you can see, this is with Jeremy Schwartz, who is a student, my star researcher at, uh, in my class, and then followed me uh, when I joined Wisdom Tree, when I'm thanking Wisdom Tree, um, investment firm here in New York that issues ETFs to make this uh, offering possible for you. So we have both signed that, those books uh, if you want to pick them up uh, in the back. Um, so without further ado, let me get to what my colleagues say is my iconic graph. Stocks, bonds, treasury bills, gold, and the dollar over 200 and 22 years further back than any other researcher investigating historical returns on those asset classes. Take a look at that stock line. And now take a look at the rates of return, compound annual rates of return. Over the last 221 years, the average annual after inflation real rate of return on a diversified portfolio of common stock, 6.8% per year. More than double any other asset. I remember after the second edition, one um, reporter came up, he said, Jeremy, this is a huge book, 600 pages. Can you summarize it in one sentence? <laughs> I had to think about it. <laughs> but afterwards I came up and I said, I'll tell you what I think the sentence that summarizes the book. Take a look at the stock line compared to all the other lines. I said the following. Stocks are the most volatile asset class in the short run, but they're the most stable asset class in the long run. Take a look at that least squares line. This is on a geometric curve, which of course means a straight line is a constant annual real return, no other asset class approaches the stability of long-term returns that stocks have. You know, when I finished the sixth edition, I went back to the first one and looked up what the real return had been. And by the way, that used data through 1992. The first edition came out in 1994 in May. I looked there, so it was over 30 years and the total real return was 6.7% per year. So virtually the same. 30 years, think of everything that's happened over the last 30 years. I won't go through it. <laughs> and the real return has remained the same. The after inflation rate of return has remained the same. You can, you can tell so much monetary history, I won't go through it. I mean, the gold standard, dollar is the same as gold until he went off gold in the 1930s, and then Nixon went off gold in the 70s, et cetera, and so on. After inflation, $1 of gold goes to $4.18. $1 of stocks, dividends plus capital gains. All, all cash flows must be reinvested. That's the way we, all finance people, are mandated to talk about real returns. <clears throat> $2,170,000. $2, Important point. Take a look at the dollar. How much it will buy. It bought a dollar at the beginning of the 19th century. Today, it buys less than four pennies. 25-fold increase in the price level. And that increase in the price level has taken place almost exclusively since the beginning of World War II, the last 80 years. 2,500% increase in the price level. What has that done to the real return on stocks? 
The answer is nothing. It hasn't impaired them at all. The real return has remained the same. That should not be a surprise. Stocks are real assets. Their claims on capital, on land, factories, equipment, patents, copyrights, intellectual property, all those are real assets. Real assets will appreciate with inflation, and they do. People ask me, Dr. Zico, are stocks good hedges against inflation? I say year by year, they're not very good. Actually, nothing is really that good year to year. But over the long run, no, they're, they're not good hedges against inflation. In the long run, they're perfect hedges against inflation. Are you worried about inflation and planning your portfolio next 10, 20, 30 years? That is a critical fact for you to remember about how you're going to plan your portfolio. And we'll talk about what the real returns are going to be on stocks, on bonds, what impacts them, and the rest. All right. Oh, you know I've been critical of the Fed. Um, yeah, it's doing a little better job now, I will admit. Um, a couple of people said, oh, my goodness, Jay Powell should get the Nobel Prize. I, <laughs> and I said, giving Jay Powell the Nobel Prize is like giving a drunk driver who just ran down a pedestrian the Nobel Prize for getting him to the hospital in time to save his life. <laughs> what, what did he do wrong? First of all, he did exactly what a central banker is not supposed to do. In fact, he did exactly what we create central banks for, is you do not monetize all the crazy spending plans of the federal government. And he didn't listen to it all. He just shelled out the money, as I'm going to tell you. Secondly, totally misunderstood a critical aspect of the inflation data, as a result, greatly underrated, underestimated the inflation at the end, in the, excuse me, at the beginning of the inflationary process, and then overestimating what inflation we're having today. But let me get to the first part over here. You know, I, I'm honored. I've been 45 years at Wharton. The four years before that, I was at the University of Chicago. And I was honored to be a colleague of Professor Milton Friedman during that time. It was his last four years. It was my first year as a young assistant professor. I spent a lot of time with him because that was my specialty, monetary theory and policy. That was actually when I got my degree was in economics, not in finance. That was my, that was my interest, but I always had the side interest in finance. I remember him telling him, he said, Jeremy, you're not going to get a good one-to-one -one correspondence between money supply and inflation, but I'll tell you, if the government ever pushes a lot of money into the system, within 12 to 18 months, you can be sure there's going to have inflation. Furthermore, in the long run, inflation money growth is going to go at a one-to-one -one relation. I remember, it was the basis of the class I taught. Many of you came up to me beforehand and told me you were in my class. How much did I emphasize how important what the Federal Reserve did and the money supply was to the inflationary process? Well, here we have it, up there, 2016 to 2021, all right? We were going along, this is M2 money supply, which is the broader money supply, including savings accounts, checking accounts, money market mutual funds, CDs, all those liquid assets, he always regarded that as the most important. Going along 5.3% a year, that's a perfect level for a 2% inflation economy. And then bang, March 2020. What happened then? You all remember what happened then. March 2020, COVID hit. We started huge spending plans. Whoa, look what happened to the money supply. Within Four months, from March to July, the money supply went up 17.5%. And then, okay, I, I can understand the first, no one knew what was happening. Okay, 
Let's give them all the money for that. But then, as we were recovering, kept on pushing money in at a rate of nearly 12% a year for the next two years. I kept on saying, this is not temporary. This is going to be permanent. When I say permanent, inflation will go down, but not the price level. This is going to cause inflation within 12 to 18 months. I was on all the programs. I was emphasizing that point time and time again. He had to rein off on the money supply. Then, of course, the, the detail is there, slammed on the brake after soaring the money supply. Now he's weakly increasing the money supply. Looks The last few weeks looks a little better, but we'll have to see, you know. Um, but we never had to have so much money. By the way, is money in the long run important? The high inflation period, 1970 to 1986, we increased money in 9.6% a year, and we had inflation of 7%. Pure theory, the quantity theory says the difference should be real growth, which is about 2 2.5% a year, works out perfectly. Then Volcker, remember, he said, enough of this. We're controlling the money supply. We'll have to squeeze interest rates as high as we can, slow loan to pan, slow the money supply for 34 years. We raised the money supply 5.4% and we achieved 2.5% inflation. And then it ratchets it up again. And then he was asked time and time, oh, our studies don't show any relation between the money. Well, not my studies. Um, you know, I have to tell you, it was one of my greatest disappointments. There's 19 people on the Federal Open Market Committee. I, I, would, I was hoping that two or three would have remembered what I studied. <laughs> now, they weren't any of my students, but I thought the Wharton, I thought the Wharton you know, monetary theorem, I'm not going to say monetarism because that's sometimes too restrictive, but that monetary theory was so important to understanding, and it worked out exactly as he said. By the way, let me show you a long run. And I, why do I have M2 going back to 1871? It's because of Professor Friedman, because of the book that he wrote in the 1960s called The Monetary History of the United States. He was first to document that the collapse of money during the Great Depression was the primary cause of that massive economic contraction. He really turned the whole profession around on that. And for his reasoning, he was awarded the Nobel Prize of Economics in 1976. Well, take a look. 2020, 25.8% increase in money exceeded any other single year in the previous 150 years. How could you think there could not be inflation? And you can see the dotted line, by the way, is inflation, which is variable and volatile. But two years, it's two years lag. Two years later, you see that oftentimes the increase in money will bring about an increase in inflation, greater than inflation in World War II, 17.8, greater inflation in World War I. It was just a matter of time. Now, people say, well, just a minute, Jeremy, what was he supposed to do? The government spent, what, $8 trillion. Well, you know what he should have done? He said, OK, uh, you know, I'll give you money for the first one. No one knew what was happening. OK, after that, he should have said, you get your own money. <laughs> How do you get your own money? Well, <clears throat> go to the bond market. We're not going to hand it to you. Handing you the money is what banana republics do <laughs> and why they have chronic inflation. We're not going to do that. You go to the bond market. If you go to the bond market, we would have had interest rates rise right away, and we would have cut inflation dramatically. I mean, there's, you know, <laughs> there's only three ways you could do it. You, you know, when you have that massive deficit, you know, you could either cut other spending, didn't do that. You could raise taxes, didn't do that, actually cut taxes. Um, or you can print the money. And is that a free lunch? Remember Milton Friedman's other famous expression, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. I knew it was just going to come with inflation. Inflation was going to tax everyone. If you're not going to tax anyone explicitly, you're going to be taxed by inflation. Trillions of dollars was taxed to people's savings. Of course, smart money is able to get around. Who is it hurting? Why are people unhappy? <laughs> um, 
eventually it has to be paid for. All right, now, what about misunderstanding <laughs> some of the indicators that might have given him warning that inflation was much more serious than he thought? All right, I'm showing you the most important single component of the consumer price index, and that's housing. Housing is 30% of the CPI and 41% of core inflation. All right, for crazy reasons, <laughs> which I won't get into, <laughs> the government has a huge lag in the way it records housing inflation. It regards you, uh, rental prices as only increasing when you renew the lease. By the way, which they do for nothing else in the entire economy. <laughs> All right. Well, as a result, BLS stands for the Bureau of Labor Statistics. There's the one that gives us the CPI, the PPI, and everything else. The gray line is the BLS measure. The actual line using real-time rent met metrics, and I'm using real-time core logic, uh, Zillow, apartment list, that we're actually obtaining month-by-month -month rents on what was happening. I was saying, oh my God, we're having much worse inflation. I'm not gonna show you that graph, but actually we got to inflation on, on, on the core of almost 10%, and actual year-over-year -year of almost 13%. Wow, it was, hey, we're not having that much inflation. And then, all right, so now the apartment went, went way up. Now it's down. Actually, year over year, rentals, now they're still much higher than they were pre-pandemic. Don't, don't, this is not a level here. There's a rate of change. Rate of change has basically gone to zero or slightly negative. All right? And that is 41% of the core. And yet, look at the BLS banner. It's only beginning, <clears throat> beginning to go down. So as a result, <clears throat> he was looking at an inflation that was much lower earlier, and now is much higher than it should be. If you would use actual apartment, by the way, owner equivalent rent is virtually the same as this. I won't go into the details of how they do it, it is slightly different, and by the way, last month it kind of deviated, and that's one reason why we had a slightly higher inflation than we should have. We can talk about that, but it's virtually identical to what, uh, what the BLS measure is. The owner-occupied rent measure, 41% of the core is being mismeasured. Our actual year-over-year -year inflation is basically zero to 1% now. If you use real-time data. And how do I know? Because I remember him answering questions during news conferences all the time. One person finally brought it up, and he said, you know, there's two measures here. There's a current measure and a BOS measure. And he said, oh, well, we believe in BOS. Then later on, he said, oh, yeah, the BOS lags. And oh, yeah, we're, we'll recognize the BOS will finally factor in and lower it toward the later end of the year, and on and on and on. But there seemed to be no recognition that the statistics that they were using were not real time. And I've learned, by the way, I've talked to some of the bank presidents They said, yes, we were not as aware of how badly that measure actually was early on, whether we would have done something different or not, uh, who knows. But that was a second major failure. Here, I'm Federal Reserve on that. All right, now, what about interest rates? You know, we all know Central banks affect interest rates. We'll talk about the Fed. We all know economic growth affects interest rates. We all know inflation affects interest rates. Fisher equation, all the rest. But let me tell you one component that is ignored that is very significant in infecting interest rates. And that is how correlated are stocks and bonds? How good a hedge are bonds to risk assets? And I, I, go, through, I go through a lot of text. I have never written a text on this. And I never talk about this. But that's a critical aspect. If you have an asset 
that moves in the opposite direction of risk assets, i.e. stocks, you have an asset that everyone wants. You have an asset that will be driven up in price that will give you a very low return. In fact, if its correlation is negative, for those people who have taken finance, it has a negative beta. It has a negative beta. Its return is less than the risk-free rate. <laughs> All right. It could actually be negative. It's an insurance policy. You don't expect to make money on insurance policies. You buy it against other risks. If the correlation is positive, you don't want it. It has to give you a much higher return in order for you to hold it in the portfolio. It is one of the most ignored factors influencing interest rates over time. Well, you all see what happened in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Correlation turned positive. And then the correlation began to fall, 91 95, 2000, 2005, 11, all the way through to record negative levels. Everyone wanted them. Why do you think the yield on the 10-year went to 57 basis points? Crazy, we say. Because they were, everyone was buying an insurance policy. Right? I remember talking, I remember talking to a portfolio manager. He said, I said, you have a lot of bonds in your portfolio. Why do you have bonds in your portfolio? That's not going to do good. He said, I know that. He said, I'll tell you why. It was a billion dollar, billion dollar portfolio guy. He said, I call, get called up on my client. When, I, when he hears the Dow is down like a thousand points, I get called up on my client. And my client says, let's, you know, let's say the, the advisor is Bill. Jim is the, the, the client. Jim asked Bill, well, how do we do today? And Bill says, well, we didn't do so well in our equities. Our equities are down four, four and a half percent. But guess what? He, Bill said, what? He said, our treasuries are up five points. So our whole portfolio is only really down two, two percent, one and a half percent. It's not bad. And, you know, Jim says, hey, great. Continue to do good work. And he hangs up. He said, you know how much that's worth? That's why I hold them. Now let me talk a little bit about this. Bonds are great hedges against geopolitical risks. They're great hedges against pandemics, financial crisis, but they are terrible hedges against inflation. All right. During the 40 years, from 1980 to 2020, we really had no inflation. So the idea of the inflation risk shrank and shrank and shrank, and all those other risks were higher and higher and higher, and it became the insurance policy, and I want the bonds, and I don't care about the yields. It had much more to do than the zero interest rate policy, that all that you know, stuff that so many people complain about, feeding speculation, all that isn't really what really was driving it. Never really made sense to me. Um, short term, yeah, but not long term, and people are looking at the long term. It was the fact that inflation risk really disappeared, and all those other hedge risks became important until 2022. Bang, that went up. And I said, oh my God, these bonds are not great risks. They are not great hedges anymore. I'm going to have to demand a higher rate of return to own them in my portfolio. Because when I look ahead at you know, what might happen next 10, 20, 30 years, there's going to be other inflationary episodes. And I've got to be compensated for it to hold it in equilibrium. Don't ignore that correlation. That's one reason why interest rates have gone up. That's, the long rate has gone up. And by the way, that inflation fear will be there for years and keep interest rates higher for years. Um, so what are we going to do on forecasts? I'll go to bonds in a second. Let me, let me just talk about stocks. Um, and then I'll go to the bonds. Stocks are selling to 20 times earnings. I'll, I'll give you a, a detail in a second. On, on different uh, markets. 20 times earnings is an earnings yield. That's a reciprocal of the price earnings ratio of 5%. The earnings yield is an excellent predictor of long-term real returns. 
talk about that a lot in stocks for the long run. Talk about all these issues, stocks for the long run. Um, so when I, people ask me, what do you think the long-term real return on stocks are? I say it's going to be below the long-term historical average, probably about five percent after inflation. Maybe a little tad higher, but it depends. We'll talk about the deviation. Mean, really, what you have is growth stocks at about 28, and you have the value stocks at about 16, 17. So you have a little bit of a difference there, depending on which way you want to tilt uh, onto that. 5% um, real return. What about um, even as current inflation fades, future interest rates will be much higher than pre-COVID because of bonds lack a hedge against inflation. That fear of inflation will keep those interest rates high. All right. When all this is said and done, where are we going to be? How far down is it going to go? If you look at the long-term projections from the dot plot of the Fed, you'll see 2.5% long-term. I don't think so. I think it's 3.5%. Because I think that real rate is up. I think the rate is up from what they think is actually going to happen. So I think when all this is done, it's 35 Now we're 5.33 three, three now. You know, five to five and a quarter, you know, five, five and a quarter, five. Five and a quarter, five and a half right now, 5.33. Um, so we need to go down on the short rate, but not relatively soon. The economy, so what's happened? What surprised everyone, because everyone was thinking of these real rates had to be so low, they realized that lenders demanded more and Issuers were willing to take it on. Listen, who are the biggest winners? Those that issue long-term bonds. Hey, I want to issue those long-term bonds. Another inflationary bout, I'm going to win. I'll be willing. Yes, it's higher than it was. I'll be willing to issue them. All right, the buyer says, oh, I need the compensation. They come together at a higher rate. Now, actually, I think the 10-year bond, four to four and a half, which is where it is today. So short-term rates are going to be down four for four and a half. Where are the tips? The Treasury inflation protected one and a half to two. Okay. So if you want real returns on 10 year, you get one and a half to 2%. Real return on stocks is five. The difference is what? Around three to three and a half percent per year between stocks and bonds. By the way, don't make the mistake that some people, oh, I can get 5% of bonds. Why am I gonna get 5% of stocks? You're comparing apples with oranges. Stocks are real assets, bonds are paper assets. If you want that inflation protection, you're getting one and a half to two. Okay? So you're getting a three and a half percent premium per year on by that adds up over 10, 20, 30 years. What's the long-term premium? Bonds were three and a half and stocks are six, eight, you know, about three, three and a half. Hey. You're almost exactly where you were on average over the last 221 years. So, you know, people say things are unusual. They're not unusual at all. Um, by the way, I, let me just say, and I'm going to go into it unless you want to talk about it. I think equilibrium P is 20, not 15, 16, 17 for the entire market. I won't go into the details. I do talk about that about uh, it's trending upward over time, and I talk about the reasons why it's trending upward over time. So we're really at that long run equilibrium, no overvaluation, but no particular undervaluation either. Um, so three, three and a three and a half percent per year average, very close to the circle. And then my last slide, you didn't think you were gonna get through a lecture without a Bloomberg <laughs> slide, did you? Um, <laughs> and that's from yesterday. I try to keep things up to date. Uh, I would have done it today, but they said that's too late. Um, so this is the major markets around the world. Estimated PEs based on 2024 earnings and 2025 earnings. Dow Jones 18, then 16 next year. There's the S&P at 20, 18 next year. You see NASDAQ at 28, 27.7. The Toronto Exchange at 14, uh, the Mexican Exchange at 12, the Ivo Vespa, which is Brazil at eight. You see Europe at 13. Now Nikkei is, is, 
is really because there's a couple of stocks there that had law, big losses, says 23. The Topix is 15, which is a much better Japanese one. So if you're 15 really in Japan, it isn't on the main screen. Of course, the Hang Seng and Shanghai Composite are 10 and under. I remember when that was 50. At one point, you have the, um, the ASX 20, it's the Australian at 17. And there's the global, the Bloomberg World Global at 17.5. Whoa. One over 17%. Wow, that, that's almost exactly a 6% real return. On Europe, uh, at 13, you're getting around a 7 to 8% real return on your, those, those are really good. I mean, basically, what, what it is, outside the United States is a value shop, <laughs> right? All the growth is here. So basically, the rest of the world is valued pretty much the way value stocks are valued in the United States. I mean, on average, maybe a little cheaper, actually, around the world. They are a little cheaper than that. But small stocks in the United States, you're getting a 12, 13 times earnings. As you keep on going up and up to the mega caps, you keep on getting greater and greater there. Um, let me end with this slide, which was the beginning slide. Um, I recommend that we're going to have a bear market at some point. We always do. We always have. Take a look at the bear markets on the long-term chart. They're mere blips on the upward thrust of the market over time. They don't seem anywhere near as scary. So the next bear market, I recommend you get a copy of my book and turn to this page. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Wow. What a treat. Thank you. So, this is my 19th impact tour in the last two years. And I can credibly say that we have not had an audience like this. Thank you. Thank so anything you would like to say to your fans? Uh, thank you for coming. I mean, wow. I mean, it's, Wharton has been so good to me. Let me do the things that I could do to make everything better, my class is better, and also, now that I don't teach anymore, I continue my education through special programs and the media, um, the same type of principles that many of you learned when I took my classes. That's awesome, thank you. And for those of you who can't see, he's actually wearing a pen tie. Yes, I today. am. So you, you come fully branded. Um, just as a reminder, we don't have a lot of time, but if you are interested in submitting a question, please use the QR code on the back of your name tag and we'll, we'll take a couple of those shortly. So I have a question for you. I'm a psychologist, you are an economist. I wanna know the psychology behind why people do the things they do, or maybe better put, why people don't listen to you. Because. <laughs> We make a lot of mistakes with our investment decisions. They, it, it has to do, I mean, there's this, the fear in the bear markets, um, even though they're temporary, as you can see, everyone has been temporary. Everyone has been an incredible buying experience. But people who are in it, oh my God, they think, you know, the end of the world. And I think that's psychological. You know, you know people get depressed and they think, I think it's never gonna get better. And people have to be counseled, yes, they will get better. Um, and it's the same thing about people fear. And what happens, I think one reason why stocks give such great returns is a lot of people just can't stand the risk. So yeah, they know, yeah, stocks are better in the long run, but I just can't take those declines. Um, you know, they, they just, you, you know, give me too many, uh, too much uh, anxiety. And they stay out of the market. The market stays too cheap relative to those who can, have the fortitude of staying in the long run. And that, you know, that's true about bad times individually too. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned stocks for the long run, 30 years, six editions. What are some of the key things that you have noticed that have changed over each of those editions? You know, I, I think 
so much has stayed the same. As I showed you, the real return on stocks has stayed the same uh, you know, as a premium despite all the things that have happened. I would say certainly one of the things that we had never seen before is the dramatic run of gross stocks over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, you know, you could call them, you know, the, the magnificent seven, the mega cap growth. You, we all know those stocks. Um, that they have continued so long to be market leaders. Now, we've had market leaders before, but then after a bear market, a new cycle begins. And this bull market, you know, after the bear market of, you know, 2022, we've had the same, well, except for some of those you know, more speculative ones, the same giants come up. Um, and that is, that is something that's different. And that is something about, you know, it's, there's, there's reversion to the mean, as you can see with that stock chart. The question is, is there going to be a reversion to the mean on the valuation of growth and value stocks? Right now, value stocks are selling at only around 72, 73 percent of their long run relative valuation. So they're cheap. They're, you know, they're, 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 as, as, they're nowhere near as cheap as they were at the top of the dot com bubble when the growth stocks were much more overblown than they are today. So we are nowhere near that. We're not in that bubble at all. But we are pressing towards that. But there is persistence here and there's growth of earnings here that is the digital world changing how we view value and growth. I, I, you know, I ask myself that question. Um, I do think that there's a bit too much enthusiasm, but they are a much greater foundation for those growth stocks now, certainly than there was in 1999 or 2000. We could be entering in a bubble, like with AI. We haven't talked about AI, but you know, will those stocks grow the way the internet stocks grew back then? No one knows. And you know, people ask me, you know, what do I, I'm forming a 10-year portfolio? They say I'm forming a 10-year portfolio. What do I do? I said, well, I'll tell you. Suppose I tell you that for the next three or four years, well, I don't know how long we're going to still have that great outperformance of those stocks, and then crash. Don't forget from 2000 to 2002, the NASDAQ was down 80% from the bubble. Now, again, we're not anywhere there. That was crazy valuations. But I'm just begin, you know, telling you, well, then, you know, if I tell you stay out of all those stocks and they keep on soaring, you'll never take my advice again, right? Um, this is the problem of an advisor, you know, he or she can be right in the long run, and if they're wrong in the short run, guess what? They have no clients. I want to ask a Wharton-related question. And uh, just to give you all a chance, I'm going to ask one more question, and then we'll open it up to the audience. So Shannon, you can come up soon. Um, Wharton is an investment. Why do you think that investing in Wharton as in terms of choosing to spend two or four years of your life in the Wharton community, gaining a Wharton education, what, how has that investment, how does that pay off for people? Oh, it, it was, a, I mean, I got a lot of offers from Wall Street, you know, and, you know, I, I turned them all down. I said I just love teaching. Hmm. I said I wanted to be in contact with the research that was current. I wanted to keep on with my practice, my ability to explain basic principles in ways that people could understand them. And I think I didn't want to leave that environment. I thought I could still be extraordinarily valuable. And, you know, Wharton was wonderful, let me do the consulting that, that I wanted to do um, at the same time. And I think it made all my consulting better. Um, and made my post Wharton career so much better. So to me, it, it was the ideal investment. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. And we'll Thank you. give you all a chance to ask questions. 
All right, we'll start off with a straightforward question for Professor Siegel that I bet more than one person in the room wants to know about. So we sense that you have strong opinions about the Fed. <laughs> what changes would you make at the Fed? Ah, all right, well, <laughs> I would have some of those students out in my audience on the FOMC. <laughs> I think we would not have made a number of the mistakes that we did in ignoring the money burst and the statistics, which I talked about extensively at that particular time. I mean, it is really, I mean, you know, Jay Powell himself, as you know, is not an economist. I mean, he, he, he's, he's, a, he's a smart man, a well-meaning man, um, and, um, you know, he takes his, his opinion from, from the staff, and a lot of them were really young, and, you know, Friedman passed away, and monet, a lot of that monetarism was lost. I mean, it's still being taught, um, and I think uh, they just got on to the wrong scenario uh, at the beginning. And, uh, you know, I think this episode, I mean, I know they now redone their thinking of real-time indices, and I think they have a better appreciation also of uh, money uh, also than they did before. So what I took away from your response was that most of the people working for the Fed went to the University of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't go to, and they didn't go to my classes at Wharton. Um, it wasn't just that, um, uh, because you, many of you know that. I mean. Money was always part of the inflation story, not one for one, one not right away. You know, we talked about all the slippages of, of the quantity theory and you know, the Keynesian attack and you know, what, what is right about it, what was wrong about it. That was you know, all part of that. It, it's, I mean, it was, to me, it was just so incredible that all that uh, you know, institutional, historical knowledge seemed to be just lost and not among you know, anyone. I mean, if I were there at the Fed, you know, I would have been descending at every meeting, <laughs> loudly at every meeting, um, to say the least, no dissents. You know, like, make sure. It goes around to everyone beforehand and says, you know, that just changes the word or something. Can you agree to this? Notice no dissents in two years. Longest period ever, no dissents on FOMC decisions during some of the most tumultuous times that we've had. I mean, I don't think that's good either. Uh, that kind of group think also can lead to bad mistakes on monetary policy. Economics and psychology. Well, I One think and the same. same thing. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Here's another pro uh, question for Professor Siegel. I will read it verbatim. It seems that pub public equity market correlation to Fed behavior and guidance is at an all-time high. So when do we return to equity prices being tied to earnings and cash flow? Well, you know, honestly, they're not that disconnected now. Yes, I think there's way too much attention to the Fed. I think there almost always was. I mean, although they caused the big inflation, which you had to cope with. You know, you know, you know the fame, there's that famous saying by Warren Buffett. If you whispered in my ear, every future FOMC, Federal Reserve action, for the next 10 years, it would not change a single decision I would make about investing in the stock market. Um, so, yeah, we, you know, there's a tremendous amount of overemphasis on this. Um, and, I mean, for instance, I think the January inflation is a lot of that that came in above expectations could be reversed in, 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 in February. By the way, they had six-tenths of a percent for month over month, which is, again, ridiculous. That was one of the reasons it, it pushed over that. Um, and that a lot of that will probably self-correct in February. So there's, yeah, I mean, people look at the details too much. But right now, you know, um, as I said, I've seen, I've seen the market far more out of whack on earnings and prices than it is today. And overall, you know, I think the market is fairly uh, value. I mean, if there's more mean reversion with growth and value, then growth is overvalued and value would be undervalued at the present time. And that is not an unlikely case, but it's not extreme. It has been much more extreme over time. 
So right now, yeah, there's just too much attention being fed to, uh, to the Fed, but very honestly, uh, I, I don't see, you know, anything like major disconnects as you do at the bottom of bear markets or you do at the top of crazy bull markets like the internet boom. Thank you. Here's a question for Dean James. Wharton in the last few years has made terrific strides regarding female student enrollment. Can you tell us more specifically what has Wharton done to recruit more female students and what do you anticipate happening in the coming years? So this was an effort that has been long in the making for Wharton. Women are 50% of the US world population, frankly, and so why shouldn't they be represented at 50% in business and in business education? Um, and we have seen a steady growth over decades of more and more women showing signs of interest in business education. But we reached sort of this plateau of around 40-ish percent. And that's when I think my colleagues at the Wharton School, starting in probably the mid-2000s, realized, let's make sure we understand what's, what the barriers are for that population of women. Um, we've partnered with a number of organizations that are supporting women interested in business. The Forte Foundation is one example of that. Uh, we have learned from employers what, uh, when women are stepping in or coming out of the marketplace and what it is that they're, what's driving them to make those kinds of decisions. And then we try to wrap around those services within the Wharton context to ensure that we're not going to make it more challenging for people to go back or make the decision to invest in themselves for education. Uh, so I think those are some of the very concrete things. We um, actually partnered, we've used analytics to better understand uh, what some of the drivers are and incorporated that insight and feedback into the decision making. And so over a period of years, we went from 40% to 42% to 48%. And so it's, it's slowly been reaching the point of parity, which is where I think it should be. That's good. Thank you. I have to be mindful of time, so this actually is going to be our last question, but it's a question for both of you. Both of you have taught students for many, many years. Observing students. And more than me, just to be sure. Perhaps, but. Because I'm so much older, that's why. <laughs> Collectively, both of you have great wisdom and experience in this area. How have you noticed students changing in recent years, but also how have you noticed students staying the same? And Professor Siegel, we'll start with you. Well, I, this is one of the things that I think I'm so privileged because I have colleagues in other schools who told me tell me they're less and less happy with their students. And that has not been true for me at Wharton. Um, I think we maintain that excellence uh, and that seriousness. Um, uh, now, I did teach my last formal class December 2019, and then I had a couple sabbatical years after that. Um, but, uh, you know, I think when you're, you're the the best you you've maintained that seriousness. So um, I, I I I feel very privileged on that. I do know that a lot of my colleagues elsewhere have found that um, you know oh just go get your stamp and out into the real world and don't care about getting that knowledge that's not as important. I've always tried to concentrate on giving you knowledge that would be important. And I think the fact that so many of you came up to me you know, before and saying how it affected your life, I mean, that was really so meaningful to me that, that I really can impact your life so many years after a class. I, I mean, I think that's so special about the Wharton students. It's lovely, Dean James. So you've been at one school for 45 years. I have had the privilege of teaching at a number of schools and, and um, there are many talented students in the world and I think Wharton has a riches of talented students. What I have observed across the board just generationally what's happening is that students are increasingly becoming interested in entrepreneurial activities. And in a business school you would think you know, they go in because they want to pursue a particular kind of industry or a sector, which business schools are, they have an infrastructure to support. But the growing interest in adding unique value 
in developing something that is of the intellectual mind of an individual now is, um, I think, growing in ways that it's not has not been true in a very long time. So that's one of the ways in which I see students changing over the years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you very much to Dean James, as well as to Professor Jeremy Siegel. Let's give him a round of applause. And we'd also like to thank you for taking the time to join us. These events are our way of saying thank you for your continued support and dedication. Remember that we have a slew of events coming up and we look forward to seeing you. Hopefully you'll be able to join us in Sao Paulo, Brazil this coming June for our global forum. And those of you who are celebrating a reunion, we look forward to seeing you back on campus in May. Thank you again, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the evening.